So this is my wave machine. What I've got are some bits of Lego to represent particles, and that means that this is a mechanical wave which actually has particles that move about. We can also have other waves that don't need particles, for example electromagnetic waves, and what these have is a changing electric and magnetic field, and that allows waves to travel where there are no particles, including things like light. Anyway, this one here is really useful because it can show lots and lots of wave properties, because what waves do is they transfer energy from place to place. So this one here is a progressive wave, and that means that energy is transferred from one place to another without actually transferring the particles. But it's pretty good, but it's not as good as it could be. So what we're gonna do is convert this from a normal wave machine into a Mexican wave machine. So this is my Mexican wave machine. I've got the people who've all got their hands in the air like Mexican waves. And I suppose I, I've just got a bit of an obsession of Lego. I've got far too many minifigures, so I thought I'd actually put them to good use. Now, when we have a wave which is moving along, this is transferring energy from one end to the other. Actually, it kind of bounces back, so there's some reflection of the wave at one end. But what we can actually start to do is look at the motion of the people. Now, what we'll see here is that the people are just going up and down. They're basically moving around their kind of middle position where they kind of just kind of rest and they oscillate or they vibrate up to a peak, down to a trough and back again. And effectively, the amount of energy transferred is related to how much these people go up and down. If we've got lots of energy, they all move down, up and down a lot more. And actually, this is what we call the amplitude of a wave. So the amplitude is how far the particles move from their rest position to their period of, to their position of maximum displacement. So that's amplitude. The other thing about this wave here you'll notice is that as energy is transferred from one end to the other, all of the people, they're just moving up and down. So they're moving at 90 degrees to the direction that the energy is being transferred. And this is what we call a transverse wave. Transverse waves, they vibrate or they oscillate at 90 degrees to the direction of energy transfer. And this includes the whole set of the EM waves, so the EM spectrum. And also it's a bit like the ripples of water on the surface of some water. So this is a transverse wave. You might have seen this uh, demonstrated at school perhaps with a big slinky, so it's a big long spring. And then what you can see quite nicely are these transverse waves. There's another kind of wave which is called a longitudinal wave. Now this one here can't really show that, but a longitudinal wave, what would happen is that the people would be moving side to side rather than up and down. And in, in a longitudinal wave, the wave, um, the particles oscillate back and forwards in the same direction as energy transfer. And this is why a slinky is really good, because you can actually see the wave kind of moving along that whole slinky. So we've got this mechanical wave. This one is a transverse wave because energy is going from one place to, to the other. We can see the amount of energy transferred is related to the amplitude of the wave. And the other thing that we can look at with this is the length of one wave. But it's actually a little bit hard to see on this. So what we can do is we can actually draw this on a graph where we have displacement up the side and we're going to be looking at the distance on the x-axis. And what I'd like to consider is this guy all the way to this person over here and we're going to look at these seven particles on the wave as we actually start to investigate wavelength in a little bit more detail. So this is very much the side-on view of the wave if it was frozen in time. And what we can label on the y-axis, the vertical axis here, is the displacement of that wave at any point. So this is our displacement measured in meters. And along here, what we have is our distance along the wave. And I'm just gonna put that as distance. Also, again, normally measured in meters. And effectively, what we can think about is if we were to sort of uh, freeze time, what we might see is that one particle, or in this case, one of the figures on the wave is in the middle position. Maybe the person next to them is at the maximum uh, height. So this is their maximum displacement up here. And then as we keep looking at these people going all the way along that Mexican wave, what we can see is that the people are spread out like this. Now, what we can think about here is people who are in similar positions. What we might see is that, that these two people here, so the construction worker and the person in the hazardous material suit, they're both at the very top of the wave. These people here are both maybe coming down uh, and they're now in the middle position there's going to be this person here, so you've got the robot, and there might be somebody else over here who are both at the very bottom or the trough of that wave. And what we can see is that there's 
a certain distance between people who are at the same position in the wave. And this is what we call the wavelength. Effectively, that's the length of the wave. So this is the wavelength. Now, the problem is that when we shorten this to use a letter to represent this quantity, we run out of normal letters, so we have to go into the Greek alphabet, and we use the letter lambda. So lambda is like a capital Y, but it's kind of upside down. So lambda is our Greek letter that we use to represent wavelength. And it's probably the first time you've come across this new symbol. But that's basically all it represents. It's just the length of one wave. Now, the other thing that we might be interested in is how much these people go up and down. If the wave isn't transferring much energy, it might have a very small amplitude and the people only oscillate a small amount. If there's loads of energy being transferred, they're going to oscillate a lot more. They're going to vibrate a lot more about around their rest position. And that's where we come on to actually think about the amplitude. So the amplitude of the wave, it's not the total height of the wave, but it's a distance from the undisturbed position that we're thinking about. So this person here, this is their rest position. They move up to their maximum position. And then this part here is their amplitude. And for these mechanical waves, we can just measure that in meters. So these two things are things that you need to be able to be able to identify from a graph of a wave. We've got the amplitude of the wave and the wavelength. And I suppose the other thing is that this graph here, it's just really um, a measure of the particles and how far they've moved from their rest position. And therefore it can apply to both longitudinal waves and also transverse waves. So effectively this is my, what you might observe with a slink and we've just kind of frozen it in time. On a longitudinal wave, what we have are the particles oscillating or vibrating in the same direction as energy transfer. And what we see is that there are regions where we have compression, and there are also regions where we have rarefaction, which is where effectively all the particles are slightly more spread out than usual. And if we wanted to look at the wavelength, it's really the distance from one area of compression to the next. Now, examples of longitudinal waves include all of sound waves, um, it also includes ultrasound, which is just sound, but at a really high frequency, above 20,000 hertz. And this is just these particles vibrating backwards and forwards. And we also have seismic waves. And the type that we're thinking about here are the primary waves. When it comes to transverse waves, again, what we now have is the particles which are oscillating at 90 degrees to the direction of energy transfer. So this is our transverse wave. And again, we can think about the amplitude. It's how much the particles are disturbed from their, un, uh, from their rest position. We can think about the wavelength being from maybe a peak to a peak or a trough to a trough. And examples of transverse waves include the whole of the electromagnetic spectrum. I've got a whole set of videos about this, but this includes radio, light, x-ray, and so on. We also have, effectively, the ripples in water are like transverse waves because as the ripples move along, uh, things on top of the water just move up and down. So we can also have water ripples. And also there are some seismic waves that are produced underground. And this is what we call our secondary waves, shortened to S waves. So here are just some examples of transverse waves. But either way, if we were to think about um, the position of one of these particles in either a longitudinal or a transverse wave, we can still represent it on a graph like this. And therefore we can identify things like the wavelength of that wave or the amplitude.